uh, welcome for coming to this talk on serverless uh, design patterns. So I want to start by talking about something that I've been doing, I guess, last night. I was looking at uh, 2014, what happened in, what are the significant things that happened in 2014? And to my surprise, I found some really interesting things. Uh, I didn't know Taco Bell introduced their breakfast menu back in 2014, which uh, I guess if you live in the US, is quite big news. Uh, but also we had Alibaba, they had the biggest IPO at $25 billion. And I think being a Chinese, I'm quite, I have a sense of natural pride that this is you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. And of course we had the uh, Bumpy Cat <laughs> happened in 2014, and of course uh, Frozen came out, and afterwards uh, everybody on the streets and radio were all singing Let It Go, uh, which I don't know, for me it was uh, <laughs> getting to the point where it would be too much at times. Uh, but the most important news for me that happened in 2014 was the fact that Amazon actually announced AWS Lambda at reInvent that year, and since then we've had this new serverless paradigm, and I've been able to play this really fun game whereby every time I say serverless, someone would correct me and say, but there's still a server somewhere, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is fun to play, uh, but at the same time, you're just missing the point completely because serverless is serverless for the same reason that you know, Wi-Fi is wireless, even though if you look behind the scenes, there's still some wireless kind of cables hanging around somewhere, but when you want to use Wi-Fi, you don't have to think about those cables for the same reason that serverless, even though there's still servers somewhere, but those are not the things that you need to think about anymore. So as a community, we argued about what does it mean to be serverless for a couple of, I guess, a couple of years, uh, and then eventually we just settled down on a few things that we can all agree on as being the definition for serverless. Firstly, it's technology that you don't pay for when you're not using it, and also it's technology that way you don't have to think about provisioning and managing servers yourself and also scaling as well. And you may also heard of uh, function as a service or FAST, which is a very, really, I guess, a very really closely related uh, term that people often talk about when they talk about serverless. And that's where you're going to find the poster boy for serverless, uh, AWS Lambda right there, and then you also have uh, spot ins functions and uh, uh, Google Cloud functions and Azure functions and so on. So function as a service is pretty close to what you actually get when you actually try to work with serverless technologies day to day in terms of writing a function which uh, the, the platform calls on your behalf when some event happens. It could be someone calling an HTTP endpoint, or it could be someone publishing a message into a message queue, or it could be some cron job that you have scheduled that runs regularly. And when you compare function to service versus other paradigms, such as uh, infrastructure to service, containers to service, and the platform to service, as you can see, based on what is your responsibility versus the provider's responsibility, FAST is very much close, it's very close to platform to service, the main difference being the unit of scaling. So with uh, uh, platform to service, you typically deploy applications and you're scaling at the application level, whereas functions, you are now scaling and individual functions that makes up the entire application. Equally, what is FAST doesn't necessarily mean that it's serverless. For example, if you take kubeless, as example there, it allows you to run function as service uh, on top of your own Kubernetes cluster. But even if no one is using, running any functions on your cluster, you still have to pay for that cluster. And of course, it's your responsibility to manage and maintain that Kubernetes cluster as well. So based on our definition, kubeless doesn't really, really, doesn't really fit the definition for serverless. At the same time, you have services like uh, S3, you have services like Google BigQuery, which does fit our definition for serverless, but they're not function as a service. So many key people in this industry, such as Simon Wilderley, who is a noted advocate for serverless technologies, and he's also a, tech, a technology strategist for many of the big corporations as well as governments, believe that serverless would fundamentally be the way that we develop and deploy software in the future, for many good reasons. For starters, your serverless application tend to be a lot more scalable than anything that you run yourself. Even though you do have some scaling limits, for Lambda, for, of, uh, for example, you can scale up as many as uh, 500 containers per minute, even though that is kind of like a sort of hard limit-ish, but it's still a lot faster than most of us is able to scale when we are running our own Kubernetes cluster, for example, because to reach that kind of velocity, you have to have a lot of spare capacity just lying around. You're not, you're not using it, but you still have to pay for it. You still have to man manage those clusters. So with Amazon, you get the 
economy of scale where they can afford to have low to low spare capacity so that when their customer need to scale, they can tap into those spare capacity without having to force the customers to pay for them. Now, of course, since you don't pay for things that when you're not using them, it means that for many applications that you run today, they can be a lot cheaper when you move them to serverless. And out of the box, you also get multi-AZ as well, which means you have a very good baseline resilience without you having to build that into your application yourself. And nowadays, and we'll talk about it later, it becomes, it's become quite easy for you to build a multi-region active, active application that can fall over, that can fail over to a different region when one of the regions is having an outage. But the biggest reason for me to go to serverless is that a lot of things are standing in my way from having an idea to actually be able to have something running in production so I can start testing the idea against the market is that you have all these things you've got to think about in terms of the framework, the language you want to use, configuring AMI, setting up load balancers, setting up auto scaling groups, having three hour meetings to talk about capacity planning and so on. When you use serverless technologies like Lambda and API Gateway, a lot of that becomes either irrelevant or becomes drastically simplified. Deployment, for example, is so simple with a framework like serverless framework, it's literally a single line command to be able to deploy something into Amazon and to be able to have something up and running right there and then. So in turn, you get far greater velocity from having an idea to having something actually running in production because you minimize the amount of undifferentiated heavy lifting that you and your team have to do in terms of having to set up servers, managing them, and also you have, once things are running, you have less operational responsibility on your own shoulders as well. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do ops anymore with serverless, it's just the things that is your responsibility and what you have to do is slightly different. I did a whole separate talk on how do you address all the typical operational responsibilities in the serverless world in terms of setting up monitoring, logging, distributed tracing, and et cetera, et cetera. So go check out that talk afterwards if you are interested. So in one of my previous companies, I worked on a non-trivial serverless application where I migrated a social network to run pretty much entirely on serverless with Lambda being a centerpiece that glues everything together. And one of the key things I learned from that experience is that events is now the, 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 the first class citizen in your, in your architecture because event-driven architectures have become so much simpler to build with technologies like Kinesis and Amazon Lambda. And events are a great way for you to build systems that are loosely coupled together, and then you can use Lambda as a glue that connects all the different pieces of the puzzle together. And over time, you see people use uh, Lambda with different event sources in certain, certain repeated ways, and you got the design patterns. But as should be customary of any talk that talk about design patterns, I'm gonna start with a, st a stern warning that a design pattern is not a recipe for success, nor is it a recipe for disaster. It is what it is. It's just a repeated way that something has been done by well, many, many times. And it's no substitute for you to have to understand what your problem is, the problem that you're trying to solve, and the constraints that you're working with. And if you're not careful and you're just following design patterns blindly, then when the context behind, underneath those design patterns start to shift, it's easy for you to start to fall into a trap and start to use, uh, well, uh, you apply yesterday's anti-patterns instead. So I guess what I'm saying here is that the design pattern is not a magic, it's not a silver bullet, and the silver bullets don't exist anyway, so let's stop chasing them. And instead, I'm gonna focus on a few high-level design patterns to show you how people are using Lambda with various event, source, event sources in AWS, but also some implementation patterns that you can use and is applicable across multiple providers. So my name is Yan. I'm a principal engineer at a company called The Zone. We are we often call ourselves Netflix for sports because we are a subscription-based platform that allows you to watch sports both live as well as on demand. And we support quite a number of different sports and leagues around the world. And we just acquired the rights for the Italian league, in fact, from next season. And we have the Champions League as well. And some of the and we also signed a deal with uh, uh, U.S. boxing, and some of the money being involved in these deals are just ridiculous. I don't know if you ever look at the, how much people pay for those rights. So we are available in five countries right now, uh, but we're also coming to U.S. and a few other countries pretty soon, and we are available on more than 30 different platforms. 
And currently, at peak, we have about 500,000 concurrent viewers. So uh, uh, for our classical, for example, more than half a million people are tuning in in about two minutes to start watching. So it does come with some really interesting scalability problems. And if you're interested in solving that kind of problems, uh, we are hiring in a number of locations. So you can go to engineering.thezone.com to check out the positions that we have open. And personally, I've been using AWS for about 10 years at this point, and some of the work that I did at Social Network has also been captured by AWS and published in their serverless well architected white paper. So I'm going to start with something very, very simple, uh, a cron job. This is something that many of us run in our architecture. We will have the server that runs some cron jobs, say, every five minutes or every hour. But when you have some, a setup like that, it means now you've got a server that you're paying for and you're not using 99.99% .99 of the time. So it's a terrible use of resources that you are paying for. So it's here that you, so you can get a lot of value for money in terms of uh, saving your, yourself money for operations by moving your cron job into a Lambda function. And then you can schedule. You can create an event in CloudWatch events whereby I schedule it to run every five minutes and when that happens, you will call a Lambda function so that I have my cron job, but executing out of a Lambda function instead. And of course, I only pay for that cron job when it's actually running, and I pay for it in, the, in terms of uh, the set number of seconds, the, sorry, milliseconds that it runs as well. And you can extend that to operate a lot of, many, a lot of things that we do manually for operations sort of things. For example, whenever you write to send it out from your Lambda function, they get captured and shipped to CloudWatch logs asynchronously. And this is one of the things the platform does for you, so you don't have to implement logging system and log shipping yourself. But CloudWatch logs is not great for search. So what people tend to do is uh, they will go to CloudWatch logs, pick a log group, and say, you know what, I'm going to stream all the logs to a Lambda function so I can get them, all of them shipped to some log aggregation service that I want to use with my uh, container-based solution as well. For example, maybe you want to use uh, Logs.io or some self-hosted Elk stack somewhere, or maybe even Splunk if you can afford it. Uh, and then, um, but now you're introducing some menu step for someone to do. Every time they create a new Lambda function, they're going to create a new log group in CloudWatch Logs. Now they have remembered to go and subscribe it to your log shipping function. So you don't want to have, to, you know, have someone to remember to do this all the time. So what you could do is, if you enable CloudTrail in your environment, then you can now create an event pattern in CloudWatch events, which whenever the system creates a new log group for you by calling the create log group API call, you're able to capture that as event and use that to trigger a Lambda function whose job is to then subscribe that log group that has just been created to your log shipping function so that whenever someone creates a new function, you, you know for sure that their logs will be captured and shipped to your log aggregation service without you having to do work constantly every single time. And in fact, this whole pattern of capturing your API calls that happens in the ecosystem and reacting to them with a Lambda function is a pattern that you can reuse for many, many things. For example, another thing to keep in mind with CloudWatch logs is that by default, it's set to never expire any of, the, any of the logs, and you pay something like three cents per gigabyte per month. So that means over time, you're going to end up paying more and more and more per month for the logs that you have accumulated in CloudWatch logs, which doesn't make any sense because, especially if you're going to be shipping all of your logs to somewhere else already. So one of the things you could do is to apply the same pattern and have a Lambda function set the auto up, automatically update the retention policy for that log group to something like seven days. And another thing you can, you can do is uh, whenever you deploy a new API, if there's some convention in the team to say all of our API endpoints should have some alarms around the latency or error count for say 400 or 500 errors, and latency say the 95 percentile shouldn't be more than a second, then you can automate those, those the creation of those alarms this initially with a Lambda function. Whenever you deploy to API, a gateway, there's a deploy, create deployment API call you can, you can react to, and with a Lambda function to automatically create those dashboards and those alarms for you. And of course, you can also use a Cloud Shield to capture events that happens when, say, someone trying to log into the console. And uh, if you see someone trying to log in at a time or from a location where you don't have any staff, then maybe someone's trying to, maybe someone's managed to get your credentials, one of your employees' credentials, so that you should alert yourself straight away. 
And similarly, I've heard that a lot of people has been now have their credentials stolen and used to do Bitcoin mining. And uh, from what the AWS guys tell me, uh, in terms of Bitcoin mining, the, the hotspot is in Tokyo and Sao Paulo. So you can also use CloudTrail to capture AC, EC2 activities in regions where you don't have any infrastructure. So when you see someone trying to spin up an EC2 instance in, say, Sao Paulo, you can use the Lambda function to then invoke to, to alert yourself as right away. So maybe someone's uh, accidentally leave their credentials on some public repo somewhere. But uh, most, I guess most of us, uh, we don't do ops for, for a living. A lot of us, uh, we build applications, uh, web apps, for example. And here, you can have a single page application stored inside S3 and exposed via CloudFront. And on the back end of things, you can have a Roof 53 pointing to API Gateway endpoint you've created, where that points to Lambda function that uses Dynamic DB table behind the scenes, for example. So here, you don't have to run any server yourself, and you're able to create a modern web application. And if you want to do authentication, you can also use the Cognito service that Amazon offers as well, which out of the box supports a number of the use, normal user flows that you, uh, you want to implement, including registration, verification, login, logout, focus on passwords, and so on. And out of the box, you get a number of leading practices in terms of how you handle and encrypt those passwords. The SRP protocol or secure remote password protocol makes sure that the password itself is never actually stored anywhere, only a hash of it, folks. And the um, Cognito makes sure that all the data is always encrypted and it supports MFA and capture and so on. And if you've got a mobile application that wants to, say, record some events into, uh, into via Kinesis, uh, you, don't you don't even need to have application, uh, sorry, an API just to do that to provide authentication. So what you could do is use a Cognito Federated Identity Service, whereby you use some third-party OAuth provider, and where you can obtain a JWT token, and you can pass it to the Federated Identity to say, hey, here's my token, and you do the validation for you, and if the token is valid, and in this case, you can exchange your JWT token with, say, um, Google, uh, Google OAuth, for example, and get back some temporary AWS credential that allows you to access AWS resources directly. So if you've got your, some uh, p uh, uh, internal APIs that you want people to use, or in the case of uh, IoT devices where you want to publish messages to AWS IoT service, for example, you can, this is how you would do authentication. And as I mentioned before, many of us want to record user events from the device or from the mobile application, from the web application. Instead of having put an API to record those events into Kinesis, you can have the client talk to that Kinesis directly. And with those uh, temporary IEM cred uh, credentials, you can also control exactly what resources the client is able to access as well. And for, for applications that need to support users from all around the world, you often also want to have a multi-region for both, uh, both for better res uh, latency, but also for resilience as well, in case one of the AWS regions goes down. And nowadays, DynamoDB supports global table, so you can have a DynamoDB table that gets auto-replicated all around the world to multiple regions. And API Gateway also allows you to have a regional endpoint as well, so you can bring your own cloud for a front distribution in front of the API Gateway instance. So then, it means that you can now really easily create a multi-region API setup with Lambda, API Gateway, and DynamoDB with minimal amount of effort. And if you want to see how to actually do it, then my friend Alex Casaboni, who now works for AWS, did a very good webinar which shows you step by step all the different ways, uh, all the different things you need to configure to set up the, uh, to do this setup. Many of us also run data processing pipelines on AWS. And the de facto guest data lake for in AWS is to use S3. And with S3, you can control assets, who can put stuff there, who can read them using IEM permissions. And you can also encrypt data on the server side with KMS out of the box. And Amazon also announced a new service at the re-event last year called Macy, which uses machine learning to, to understand the content that you store in your S3 bucket, and it knows to look, to look for content that contains uh, potentially API keys, credentials, or user identifying information, which is now more and more important because all of us have to think about GDPR, and we want to make sure that we don't store user identifiable information, including in our S3 bucket, and uh, when Macy finds those information is being stored in S3, it will create an alert for you so that you can get that out of the box as well. 
In terms of getting data into S3, many people would use Kinesis, and then they would set up fire holes to, to collect events from Kinesis and then put them into S3 bucket in batches. And again, you can do that with just a few configurations or using CloudFormation or Terraform without having to write any code yourself. Where you do want to do some processing for events that happen that gets captured in Kinesis, of course, you can subscribe a Lambda function to that Kinesis stream. And you can also use Lambda function to do some transformation on the events that gets funneled through from Kinesis to Firehose as well. So in this case, you may want to match the events from one, uh, one format to another one before they get stored into S3, for example. And as soon as the file gets dropped into S3, you can trigger another Lambda function to do additional processing if you want to, or have the Lambda function ship those data to somewhere else. Many people would use, the, use, would use this Lambda function to put data into DynamoDB in a batch or put them into Elasticsearch as well. And another thing that I've done quite a lot is that I've been using Google BigQuery for many years, which is a great platform for doing BI workloads. So with Lambda function, you can, you can react to a file being dropped into S3 and then just stream all of the events in that file to Google BigQuery live. And of course, uh, I think two years ago now, Amazon announced the, I guess the competitor for Google BigQuery with Athena, which allows you to run ad hoc queries against all the data that you have stored in S3. And then you can also use a quick site to visualize those, uh, the results of those queries as well. So if you only care about submitting events into Kinesis, getting them put into files into S3, and then run some BI queries and be able to visualize those results, then you can, you can do this with a few, uh, few resources that you create with CloudFormation or Terraform without having to write any code yourself to do any processing and the data, sort of data pipe, uh, piping. So that's a quite a powerful thing that many people are doing nowadays. But I want to circle back to something I touched on earlier in terms of this whole event-driven aspect of uh, serverless. As I mentioned, so, uh, events are now more and more popular because of how easy it is to build an event-driven architecture using serverless technologies. And the de facto resource there is uh, to use uh, Kinesis in AWS. So suppose you've got microservices. You have a few separate services with their own boundary context. And whenever you introduce a state change, maybe creating a new user or updating a user's profile information, you can publish those as events into, Kinesis, into a centralized Kinesis stream, which then you can have other Lambda functions or other subsystems reacting to those uh, changes, those, state, sorry, those events. And those different subsystems, they're all their own, so their own boundary context because it's all microservices. So they will have their own backend store. You may have some, some services that uses IoT to publish updates to uh, IoT devices you have, or maybe to do some updates in the DynamoDB table. And of course, when the, those subsystems re receive some events or changes uh, the state of the user in the system, for example, they will also publish them as events back into the Kinesis stream so that other systems can now also react to them as well. So having this centralized stream of events of everything that's happening in your system allows you to build your, your, your application in a way that's really loosely coupled through these events. So as I mentioned, you have a bunch of services. They all have their own boundary contact because they're all microservices. And so when you need to cross over those boundaries, rather than having services being coupled to, tightly to each other, you can, use, you can decouple them using events with uh, Kinesis. And this, of course, is not a new idea in the serverless. It's been around for quite a few years. In fact, a friend of mine has been writing a book, trying to, been trying to write a book for, on the unified, this idea of unified log processing for quite some time now. So one of the interesting things, when you, one, of the, I guess one of the challenges that comes up in this space is now you have different boundary contexts. They're all, they're, all submitting, they're all emitting events or things that are happening in that boundary context. And they're all reacting to events that are happening elsewhere in, in, the, in, in the architecture. So you need to make sure that with, those, with regards to those contracts, when you make a, a change to the event, the payloads, the shape of the payload, you're not going to break some other system that it depends on those events you're publishing. And that's where things like Open API Spec comes in, which has recently introduced the Async API Spec, just for precisely for these type of messages-driven, so event-driven systems. So that's how you can, how does, that's how you ensure that you, when you change the schema for your event, you're not, you're gonna, you're not gonna bring downstream systems that depend on those events. 
The PACT project, which is uh, one of the, guess, the most popular frameworks for doing consume, consumer-driven contracts, they are also being expand, ex extending their capability to support uh, serverless as well, whereby if you go to uh, this particular, well, there's a separate branch where they're doing some uh, proof of concept work, whereby they give you a CLI to where you can, you can run a command to validate that your application is not breaking the contracts for the events that you're publishing, so that before you deploy any changes to your application, you can check that those events that you're submitting is still back compatible and you're not going to break the contract between you and the consumer of your events. So I love working with events and love working with serverless, but I think one place we shouldn't use events is to use them to drive or orchestrate workflows within the same boundary context. And this is a mistake that I've made myself and I also see a lot of people do them as well. The problem when you, when you try to do this, whereby you have something happens via API gateway, uh, so via an API endpoint, and then you trigger an event to trigger some processing, and then, and then publish another event to trigger the next step in the processing pipeline, and so on. The problem here is that is you, you're giving yourself a, a challenge of how do you do tracing across these uh, asynchronous event sources and lambda functions, which is a lot harder to do and, uh, and, and to do well compa uh, compared with the more synchronous, invocation, synchronous event sources. And also, this, this whole workflow doesn't exist as a standalone concept in, in your application. For someone to understand, say, I've got this user sign-up flow that requires uh, three different steps. They can't really point to one thing in, in, in your code to you understand, okay, that's it, that's the thing, that's, that's my workflow, three different steps. You have to instead put together the pieces yourself in your head to understand, okay, I've got three separate functions they, the, that react to different event sources, and together they form the workflow for how a user is signed up into the system. So instead, what you should do is use something like Amazon's uh, step functions, which allows you to create a step machine with the different steps of how of, of to create your workflow as a state machine with multiple steps. And step functions also gives you a much more flexible handling around the retries, how you do error handling, or if you want to do branching, for example. The trade-off with step, uh, fun step functions is that it's quite expensive by comparison. If you do, so every single one of these boxes is one stage, is one stage in, the, in the state machine, and every time you change, it has one chance, state transition, and you pay something like $25 for a million transitions compared to a, uh, about 50 cents for a million invocations of Lambda functions, uh, provided that you're using, I think, 256 meg. That means when you're using step functions everywhere, the cost can start to rack up pretty quickly. So what I typically do is I use uh, step functions for those critical user flows, like uh, someone making a purchase or someone uh, user trying to sign up, for example. And as you introduce state changes in those individual steps or your state, in your state machine, don't forget to also publish them as events into a Kinesis stream so that other subsystems can also react to them and again, it's all about events, all about event uh, building systems that are loosely coupled. So those are some high-level design patterns. I see people use uh, Lambda with other different event sources available in AWS. So let's look at uh, some implementation patterns of how you actually do certain things and uh, talk about, I think, an important topic that we don't talk about enough, which is how do you choose different event sources in the different situations and leverage the behavior between the event source and the Lambda function itself? I want to start with a decouple invocation, which is a pattern that came straight out of the SOA patterns book. And it's a pattern for you to, to, to make it easier for you to handle spikes in traffic in a graceful way. And it's also quite good for dealing with long running processes, which is more important in the serverless world because with um, API Gateway and Lambda, even though your Lambda function can run for five minutes, and that's a hard limit right now, your API gateway instance will stop listening after 29 seconds. So even if your function can run for five minutes, API gateway is gonna give up and time out after 29 seconds. That means if you wanna do anything that's long, that can take longer than 29 seconds, you need to find some way to do that without, having to, without causing the API gateway layer to time out. Another thing that we often have to deal with is uh, we have to work with downstream systems that are just not as scalable as our own system. Uh, in my current line of work, I have to work with so many different third-party systems that uh, can't even handle five requests per second, uh, whereas my, you know, in our system, we often have to scale to you know, I know, something like 3,000 concurrent requests per second when, some, when the match is about to happen. And, um, 
so one way, to, one, one way to deal with this is, so that is to make sure that when we are talking to the downstream systems, we, have a, we control how much throughput we project onto the downstream despite how much traffic is hitting our own system. Because when we try to put too much load onto the downstream, we're going to cause them to slow down. Maybe if they have some issue, we've done it with uh, the database behind the scenes. There's some constraints around how quickly they can scale up. And when we try to, when we overstretch their throughput, they can time out. And if we're not careful, they can cause our own system to error and time out as well. And you end up with a cascade failures in your microservices. And as the name suggests, this pattern decouples the request from the response. And a typical example would be someone make a client making a call to API to say, hey, you do some work. And the API goes, uh, yeah, sure, uh, I'm going to queue up some job for some background worker. But in the meantime, here's a 202 to say that I've accepted your request. And when the response is ready, you can find it at this location by returning a, a location header that's in the HTTP response. And the client can then poll for results every now and then to say, hey, is my result ready yet? And whilst we're still waiting for the background worker to finish, we just keep returning a 202 with a location. And when the job is done, then the, the worker will notify the API. And the next time the client polls, then we can actually re respond with a 200 and the actual response that the user was looking for in the first place. And doing this allows us to amortize any spikes in traffic that we, that we experience so that we don't project them onto our downstream system. So in this case, if we can control the concurrency for the background worker, that means at any moment in time, we, also, we only call the downstream for uh, as frequently as it's able to handle, so that uh, if yeah, we experience a spike in traffic, those additional low will just get done a bit slower than before, but we're not going to overwhelm our downstream system that's not able to catch up. And doing this also allows us to because, because it removes the urgency for us to give the caller a, a, a response, it also means that we can be more flexible in terms of how we deal with errors and so on, and also means that we can respond to the caller right away, and that you can then do some clever things in the UI to indicate the status of the, of the job, the same way that when you send someone a message on the WhatsApp, that is an asynchronous process that can take quite a long time. And the WhatsApp does this by showing you different ticks to, show, to tell you when the message has been sent and received uh, by the other side and when it's been read and so on. And since we can be more flexible in terms of how we deal with errors and retries and so on, it means that we can, we can be better at dealing with any temporal issues that we experience with regards to the downstream system. So let's walk through one simple example. Uh, we have API with uh, API Gateway and Lambda with uh, some DynamoDB table for storing the jobs that you're, you're currently doing. So when someone publish, so they do a post to your API, you accept the job and you create some metadata in the DynamoDB table to say the result is not quite ready. In the background, you're gonna queue up some task in SQS so that uh, in the meantime, you're gonna res respond with a 202 and you've got some Lambda function on a cron job that posts SQS every, say, couple of seconds. And it's going to pick up those long running tasks that need to be done. And also remember, notice that we have this uh, timestamp, we have this uh, created time at uh, timestamp. Uh, the reason why we you typically need to do something like this is because you still need some way to time out the clients from having to poll indefinitely when there's something going on that you can't, you can't successfully process the, the message, for example. And the client is going to pull your API to the, at the location that you told uh, you return in the first place to say, is my result ready yet? And in this case, the result is not there. So we're going to say, sorry, it's not ready, but here's a 202. And when the job is ready, the background worker, a Lambda function, will save the response in the DynamoDB table. So the next time someone asks for the results, we can now return with a 200 with the actual response that you asked for in the first place. So one of the reasons that uh, this is where, where you have to think about in terms of event source and what you want to use with SQS is currently not a supported event source for Lambda, which means that in order to get events from S tasks from SQS into a Lambda function, you have to do some polling yourself. And the typical way people do that is using a cron job with uh, CloudWatch events to trigger a Lambda function every, say, couple of seconds or every minute or so. But instead, you can also consider uh, well, support for SQS is coming. Amazon announced it at the AWS Summit in San Francisco about two months ago, but they haven't given any 
a definitive date in terms of when that's going to come. So in the meantime, if you don't want to do that manual polling yourself, you can also consider using something like a Kinesis stream or DynamoDB stream, whereby you can do the, uh, where the events will get pushed to your function without you having to do a, a manual polling. At the same time, you can also control the concurrency that you have in terms of the, how many Lambda functions you're running using, uh, with Kinesis, you can use shards. With Kinesis, every shard will have a dedicated instance of your function. So you have one function subscribed to a, to a Kinesis stream, and you have five shards in that stream. That means that any moment in time, there will be five instances of that function all running at the same time. So if that function is talking to some downstream system, then you know for sure uh, you, the maximum parallelism, you're gonna, the maximum throughput you're going to expose to a downstream is five requests per second. You can also use SNS. But the default behavior of SNS and Lambda is such that every message you publish into SNS will create a new instance of your function. Therefore, out of the box, you're going to get a one-to-one -one mapping, which means when you experience a spike in traffic, that spike is going to get projected onto your downstream system one-to-one, -one, and now you have lose the ability to amortize the spikes in loads. What you could do instead, and this is what you, what you should do when you're using SNS for this kind of workload, is to set the max receive per second delivery policy on the SNS topic. This is how you can control the maximum concurrency in, with regards to how many Lambda functions we're running at the same time when the, you publish lots and lots of messages into SNS at the same time. So the next part I want to talk about is uh, PubSub, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with already, whereby you have a publisher or events and a bunch of subscribers decoupled through some intermediary broker. And uh, every message I publish should be received by all the subscribers. And it's a good pattern for decoupling when you want to do different types of data processing in reaction to some message being published. And they also allows individual publishing, pub uh, sorry, processing to fail independently without you having to then resolve how to deal with those uh, partial failures. Again, you can consider using SNS, Kinesis, DynamDB, Streams, and so on. And I think here, the, 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 standard, the, the most popular option is SNS, whereby you can have many Lambda functions all doing diff kind, different kind of processing uh, on, to the, uh, for any message that goes, gets published into a SNS topic. And a nice thing with SNS and uh, Lambda is that because it's an async event source, you get two retries out of the box. And if the event, if you still fail to process those messages, then you also get that letter queue support as well. So that means if I've got a Lambda function that's reacting to messages getting published into SNS, for some reason it keeps failing. And after two retries, I can also have a dead letter queue set up in, say, SQS, where I can catch anything that I couldn't process the first time. And then I can have an alarm set up to then alert someone when those messages start to build up. And at that point, I can, do, I can manually intervene and, uh, in, and inspect what was the reason why those events couldn't be processed and maybe reprocess them afterwards. As, as we mentioned just now, with SNS and Lambda, it's one invocation per message. So now we need to consider the impact in terms of the, the, any spikes in traffic being projected onto the downstream. So when you want to use SNS, again, you need to think about that and, use, and set the max receive per second. Another thing to keep in mind with Lambda and SNS is that with Lambda, you have a default soft limit of 1,000 concurrent executions in, a, in, a particular, in any region, which means that if any moment in time you publish a large number of messages to SNS, every single message turns into a Lambda function running somewhere, now you can potentially go over that soft limit of 1,000 concurrent executions, and you can have uh, functions being throttled, but more importantly, other functions in the same region that can also be throttled as well. Another thing you can, you, another problem you can run into with SNS and Lambda is that if you have any temporary, uh, temporary issues with regards to, say, some other system that you depend on is not available, in a simple example whereby you just exceeded what the downstream can handle, you, so you get a bunch of errors, with the retries you get out of the box, chances are by the time those failed, traf those failed messages get retried, they will succeed, and that's great. But the problem is, what happens when those outages, uh, when those spikes goes on for a long time, then even the, the retries will still fail. And if your downstream is, have, is being just flat out, you know, being unavailable for some period of time, that means any message that you receive during the outage would not be able to process. 
Of course, you've got to delete the queue to catch anything that you couldn't process, but that means now you're creating work for yourself to do afterwards. So instead, think about what happens if you use Kinesis instead. The thing about Kinesis and Lambda is that the error behavior is very different. With Kinesis, when your Lambda function couldn't, handle, couldn't successfully process the batch of record, it gets retried with the same batch of record until such a time either your function succeeds or if the data is no longer available in the stream. In Kinesis, the Kinesis will keep your data for up to 24 hours, which you can extend to, I think, up to 14 days. And during that time, if your downstream is having a problem for, say, a couple of hours even, it will just keep on retrying until your downstream comes back online, in which case you will just carry on from where you left off without having to build any additional retry mechanism yourself. As we talked about earlier, with Kinesis and Lambda, it's one invocation per shard, which means you have, good, you have very good control in terms of concurrency as well. So this gives you better handling for temporal issues, uh, where you have, again, like we talked about earlier, you can amortize any spikes in load, but also when your downstream is unavailable for some period of time, you will just retry when the downstream becomes available. And interestingly, with, uh, within AWS, Kinesis is not the only stream available either. You can also have done with DB streams whereby everything you, anytime you write or delete or, or, or insert or update a role in DynamoDB, that becomes an event in the DynamoDB stream which you can subscribe a Lambda function to. So the question often, like, I get often asked this question of whether or not you should use Kinesis streams or DynamoDB streams. I think the most important question to think about here is what is your source of truth? It's a source of truth for most systems that we built. When you write something to the database, that means that change is canon in the state of a system. But if, we have, if we're building an event source system, then that may not be the case anymore, whereby something being written to the stream is now considered canon to the system, to the state of a system. And with DynamDB as well, you're also limited to events that are particular to the data you have in that particular table. And uh, those events describe what happens inside DynamoDB table. So you'd be role updated, be role deleted, that, but those are not events in your application. We have to then translate those events into, say, user created, user profile updated, so that we can actually work with events that are each in our application domain. And for me, that's one of the things that's, that's really annoying when you're working with DynamoDB streams. From the operational side of things, uh, interestingly as well, that the DynamoDB will auto, auto scale the number of shards in the stream based on the number of partitions they actually have in the table, which on one hand is great, that means uh, you don't have to build any auto scaling capability yourself, but on the other hand means now you lose a bit of control in terms of the uh, concurrency uh, you have in the Lambda function. And you also cannot extend the data retention policy for more than 24 hours as well. In terms of pricing, DynamoDB is charged based on number of read requests you have from the stream, uh, as well as the, well, you still pay for the table itself, but there's a separate pricing, but for the stream only, you only pay for, you don't pay for any write, you pay for a number of reads, which interestingly, when you read from a Lambda function, those reads are free, which means uh, in terms of pricing, you, with, and you're using DynamoDB streams with Lambda, you get a stream for free, you just pay for the throughput that you have for the table. So when you consider if you've got a system whereby you're publishing one message a second, then the often get to, you know, people often told me that, told me that Kinesis is really expensive by comparison, which is true when you're talking about you know, one message per second. But when you look at what happens by the time you scale that up to say a thousand messages a second, the, the picture looks very different. So even though with Kinesis, you're paying for the shard hour, so even though you're, doing, you're not doing anything, you're still paying for that shard 24-7, but because of the, the price per million request with Kinesis is much lower compared to SNS or SQS, it means that when you're doing any, so even a moderate level of load, say a thousand messages a second, Kinesis can be a lot cheaper because you get a lot of throughput per shard. And with SNS and SQS, they can be quite expensive even when you reach, say, a couple hundred messages a second. With DynamoDB tables, uh, you only pay for the throughput on the table, so you certainly fall somewhere in between. Of course, you shouldn't take those price projections at face value because a lot of things can affect them in terms of the size of the payload, the, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you don't have to stop there as well. You can have one pops up, stack up on another one, whereby you can have a Lambda function 
forward messages on to other destinations that are maybe not supported by SNS natively. But when you do that, do keep in mind that now it's your responsibility to deal with retries and deal with partial failures. So if your function is publishing messages to all those other things, imagine if one of them fails, what do you do at that point? Do you retry the whole lot? Do you find some way to only retry that particular destination? So the last one I want to talk about is the Saga pattern. It's a very useful pattern for managing failures whereby we have a distributed transaction in our microservices where something happens, we need to update multiple systems. How do we do that in a way whereby when one of, them go, one of those, one of those uh, transactions, one of those uh, steps fails, we have to roll back the whole thing. So this is uh, something that, uh, uh, that's been around for quite a while. It's, I think the, the paper that mentioned it was written in 1980s. And uh, Katie McCaffrey, she's an engineer at Twitter, talked about the pattern itself. I go to a couple of years ago, very good talk. Go check it out afterwards. The slides will be available online. Whereby, imagine you've got a travel booking system where you need to book the hotel, you need to book the flight, book the, tra the car travel as one transaction. And if any one of them fails, you want to be able to then roll back all the changes that you've made, all the bookings you've made so far. So here, every action, like booking a hotel, booking a flight, and booking a car rental have got an equal and opposite compensating action or rollback action whereby you can then apply to cancel the booking you've made. And you can model all of those actions as well as rollback action as lambda functions. So I've got a bunch of lambda functions here to do the booking for the hotel, uh, the booking of the flight, and as well as the cancellations for each, or the, each, each one of those actions as well. And we need some coordinator to, uh, to allow us to track the state of this transaction and to apply rollback at uh, any moment in time. So we can use step functions to do exactly that. Whereby here, I've got a step function that's going to try to book the hotel first. If successful, go and book the flight and the car rental and finish and on the unhappy path. So for example, if a rental failed, then I'll cancel any changes I've made at this stage but also cancel the, the, the flight and then cancel the hotel and end up in the failed state. So suppose I want to book a trip to, uh, to, uh, to Dublin from London and I'm going to stay in the Premier Inn. So the happy path is going to book all of those things for me and going to finish, finish the transaction. And on the unhappy path, then it's going to, it knows how to, it knows what to roll back as well as any, any um, state changes that's happened in this transaction so far as well. And the code is available online, so feel free to go check it out. And I mentioned before, a lot of the DevOps stuff uh, that you have to do with serverless, I've also been putting them together into a video course uh, for Manning, so you can also get 40% off whilst we're in early access. And with that, uh, I think I'm just in time. Uh, so uh, thank you guys uh, for being here today. Okay, sure. If uh, anyone got questions, okay. If got any questions, if if not, then uh, you can also uh, also uh, just ping me on the social, uh, on, um, on Twitter later as well. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to fly to back to London right away. So uh, it's been nice talking to you guys. Uh, you know, uh, feel free to, to 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 reach out to me if you've got any questions after this. Great. Okay. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>